Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good morning. So, as Elena said, uh, uh, Tiago and I are presenting on uni using Linux as a secure bootloader for open fast servers. So, we both are from IBM. We work for Linux Technology Center in uh, IBM, and both of us are contributing to the kernel. Uh, this is a disclaimer to start with. This work represents a view of the author, that is our, both of us, and does not necessarily represent the view of IBM. All design points disclosed here are subject to finalization and acceptance, and they may or may not be the part of the final product. Less of the things as there. Okay, uh, here is the agenda. Uh, we will start with the secure boot goals and requirements as per open power. And to satisfy those requirements, we are trying to see what the existing mechanisms in the kernel which we can reuse. There are some gaps in that, and we'll talk about them, and we'll also talk about our proposed solution. And then finally, the patch status and the summary. Okay, to get it started. So, secure boot goals and requirements. Uh, I assume here everybody would be knowing about secure boot, and we have heard about it either in other slides or in the previous LSS. So still, just to give a brief overview, uh, it is a protection against boot kits and the root kits, and it is basically to make sure that any firmware or any operating system you load on the, on the server is basically verified, genuine, and the, from the owner as you expect it. So this is the same, what we are targeting. It's for the open power secure boot solution. The second thing is, it's also a requirement for the standards compliance, and two of them as I listed. NIST SP 800-147B and Common Criteria OSPP 4.1. Okay, uh, I'll first start with the Open Power Secure Boot high-level overview, and then we will see what problem actually we are focusing into the whole solution. So, here is uh, the firmware secure boot and OS secure boot. As you see, okay, uh, the Open Power the root of the it starts with the SB, which is basically a sign, uh, trusted uh, code embedded into the uh, hardware. And, okay, sorry, I think my hands, yeah, embedded into the hardware, and from where the chain of trust actually starts. Uh, as I told, every in secure boot, every image before loading the next image is supposed to verify it. And that is what is done. The SB verifies the host boot. Host boot verifies ski boot, which is also called as Opal, and ski boot verifies the boot kernel. These are the part of the firmware, and they are stored in the processor flash as a signed firmware containers. These signed firmware containers are actually the headers, which are prefixed before the images, and they have a defined, uh, defined format. Uh, it's uh, that the overall secure boot uh, perspectives are being discussed in other LSS, and we are not going into details of that. Uh, this processor flash is not locked, so we protect the signed firmware containers via TPM. Now the next point comes is the OS secure boot. So once the bootloader is there, boot kernel is there, it needs to load the host operating system. Uh, the open power bootloader is actually a kern Linux kernel based uh, loader, which is a petit boot. It's a user space application in, on the, running on the kernel, which does a key, loads the kernel images from different uh, options and then key exec it as a host OS. Today's discussion is actually about making sure this path from the boot kernel to the host source, verifying the kernel images, which is the requirement for as part of end-to-end -end secure boot solution. Uh, so getting into the bootloader details now. So as I said, it's a Linux kernel-based bootloader, and Petit Boot is the application which does the KXF. It can load the images from uh, different mechanisms, either as a network, from local disk, from SAN, et cetera. And then the host OS can continue the chain of KXEC, which is like common for any other Linux uh, possibilities. So requirements, okay. We need a verified kernel. That is a requirement, core re basic requirement for the secure boot. This kernel can be fetched from any uh, multiple ways. And we have to make sure that whichever way we get the kernel, it should be verified before loading. The second thing is that the secure boot solution, basically a system can be in a different mode of, as part of the secure boot also. It might be in a setup mode, which uh, may not require you to do the verification. It might be in the audit or user mode. The user mode enforces that you verify everything, and the audit mode tells you to do the verify, but even if the verification fails, it allows you to boot. It just logs that the verification has failed for later 
uh, analysis. So these different states of the secure boot needs to be honored. The policies as per them has to be honored. Uh, then you need the firmware key support. It is possible that your firmware is signed with a set of firmware keys and your kernel image is also signed with the same firmware keys. For example, DB, KEK keys. So it is required that the kernel can verify the, bootloader can verify the kernel using these firmware keys. Uh, maintain the secure boot policies across the KEXEC. When the kernel does a KEXEC, it can change the boot parameters option. So it is possible that people can try to do overriding. So what is required is that based on the secure boot state of the system, the KEXEC policy, that these policies should be maintained across any set of KEXEC chains. And you need, we need that the KEXEC load is disabled because KEXEC load allows unsigned kernel images to be loaded. And the last thing, uh, as I said, in, as sh shown in my first diagram, we, we actually divided it into two domains, firmware and the operating system secure boot, because the OS secure boot kernel images can come from various op uh, uh, options, but firmware is from the platform owner. So it is possible that sometimes you distros might want to load unsigned kernels uh, for backward compatibility, but then you don't want to disable the whole secure boot solution. So your firmware secure boot is still enabled, but you allow unsigned kernels to be loaded. So that is the last point. Okay. So the thing is, we need this for our last stage of loading the host source. And we had a kernel-based bootloader. So the point is, can we use something which already exists in the kernel? And from yesterday's, today's, and all of earlier discussions, people know about integrity measurement architecture somewhere. So we consider this is as a possible solution. Tiago will discuss about that. OK, hello. Um, so I'm a, as we have seen here today and, and in other uh, presentations and conferences, IMA is a mature uh, subsystem in the kernel being used in production. So uh, we turned to it to implement secure boot. It can be uh, used to enforce the secure boot rules that we want. Um, so how, how does it work to have a secure boot <coughs> implemented using IMA? Uh, when, when the bootloader and starts, it has to check the secure boot state, uh, which can be um, audit um, our setup or user mode. And depending on that, it will load the, the firmware key, uh, keys to the kernel key ring and will load the policy that will enforce the secure boot settings of the firmware. And finally, it will be ready to, to in, um, verify the, the, the kernel uh, before allowing it to be loaded and, and booted. So, well, I, I will not spend a lot of time with IMA basics. We had talks here about that already. But basically, we have three operations in IMA, um, measure, appraise, and audit. Um, when you measure, you can also store the measurement in the measurement list, as was said before. and. At the top here, we have an example with IMA policy with three, three rules. <clears throat> the rule in the middle here is the one we are most interested in for a secure boot. It appraises um, the kernel that is loaded via KZEC file load. And the argument here, appraise type equals IMA sig, is telling uh, IMA to verify a signature stored in, in, uh, in the file. So how do you do that? Um, you have to use the AVM CTL command, which will add a security.ima extended attribute. That extended attribute contains a signature in a very simple format, as can be seen here. Um, and with that, uh, IMA is able to, to retrieve that signature and, and, and verify if, it, if the kernel <coughs> is correctly signed. So if this works, and it does, then uh, what's the problem? We, we found three issues that we solved, and we are going to expand on them during this talk. Um, I will explain the first one, and um, Nina will go into more details on the next two. So the first one is related to the use of extended attributes. Um, it's a very common method uh, to when you uh, boot 
your computer that you fetch your kernel from the network uh, and some methods of booting via the network, they w will not uh, allow extended attributes to be fetched, for instance, uh, HTTP or TFTP, or even local file system, uh, some file systems used for USB keys, for example, they don't support extended attributes, so um, we need to support secure boot even in the, those scenarios, so this is a problem we have found. So, um, well, just, just to reinforce, <laughs> these are examples of met boot methods that, that Petit Boot allows. Uh, they're fairly standard uh, in bootloaders. Uh, some of them allow uh, trusted, <coughs> sorry, some of them allow extended attributes, some don't. Um, so our solution involves embedding the signature in the file. Um, we, the kernel has a method for that already for module signatures. Uh, there's a kernel feature where you can um, uh, require that modules are signed and, and only signed modules can be loaded. And the <clears throat> format of the signature is very simple. Uh, you just append at the end of the file um, this structure, which contains a PKCS7 <coughs> message with a signature. Um, this suits us because the, the, the PowerPC kernel is an ELF image as well. You can append contents to it and it will still be usable. So that's what we decided to, to use. There, there's a tool already in the kernel, uh, scripts slash sign file that performs this step. So that's what we use. <clears throat> uh, when we added appended signature support to IMA, uh, we wanted to do it in a way that's um, backwards compatible in the sense that if you already have a file that has an extended attribute signature, uh, nothing will change if that file um, has <clears throat> an appended signature as well. Uh, so what happens is that uh, if there's no, ex uh, well, first, the first step is there's a new uh, argument you can pass to the appraise rule, uh, um, which says to IMA that it can expect a mod sig. We, we allow it to use a, a mod sig to verify the signature. Uh, and if you have that and there's no extended attribute signature in the file, then of course, IMA will look for, for uh, an appended signature and try to use it. Uh, and the other case is if there is an extended attribute signature, but the signature is uh, signed with a key that the kernel doesn't know about. It's not present in, in the kernel key ring. So in that case, it will ignore the extended attribute signature and also look for um, an appended signature in the file and, and try to use it to verify it. Um, so uh, even though secure boot is not about measurements, um, there is an interaction with measurements that we found that we, we had to, to uh, address. So I, I'm coming back to, to this measure step and storing it in the measurement list. Um, just an aside, the rule in the middle has a, the, the setting that I mentioned that you can add. You, in the appraise rule, you can say appraise type equals I'm a sig or mod sig. Then you are telling IMA that it can use a mod sig if there is one. Um, so uh, before I, I talk about our issue, um, how does IMA know what to put in the measurement list. It has a concept of an IMA template. The IMA template <clears throat> uh, tells it which, which information should be added to an entry in the measurement list. You can use uh, template fields for, for saying that you want to store the digest, the name of the file, and if there's a signature, a signature as well. So there are some predefined IMA templates. For, for instance, the IMA-SIG here which includes the, the signature. And in that case, you have a measurement entry like this one. Um, <clears throat> the first, the, well, uh, just to explain a little bit this entry, uh, the first number here in yellow is, is the PCR 
the TPM PCR that is extended with this measurement uh, then follows the, the contents of the PCR at the time of this measurement. And then you have the template that IMA is configured to use, in this case, IMA-SIG, um, which, um, uh, as, saw, as, as shown on the, this slide, it tells that IMA should start the digest, the name, and the signature of the file. So that's what follows here in blue. The, this is the SHA-256 <coughs> digest of the entire contents of the file that was appraised. Uh, the path of the file, and then at the end, uh, the contents of the security.ima extended attribute uh, containing the digital signature. So one, one property of these that is very useful is you can, just with this entry, um, during audit, for instance, uh, know whether the signature uh, is valid or not for this file. Um, the, um, digest of the file is, is the digest that is used in the signature to validate the content. So with, with this digest and this signature, you can say whether the, the signature was valid or not when, when the file was appraised. Uh, the problem we found is that when you append a signature at the end of the file, you modify the file contents, obviously, and with that, <clears throat> the digest uh, of the file as measured by IMA is not the same one that was used to sign the file anymore, and you can't um, at a later point verify whether the signature was valid or not. So we solved, solved this by introducing a new template field called D-SIG, um, which uh, tells IMA to store uh, not only the Sorry, uh, it tells IMA to store the contents, the, the hash of the contents of the file, but ignoring the appended signature at the end. Uh, this uh, field, this hash, then is the one that is expected to match the one in the signature. And here in this example, we see at the end of the file the contents of the appended signature as well in the in that entry. And with that information, we can once again verify that the signature is valid or not <clears throat> when the file was, was appraised. Um, one last point uh, that's also not uh, directly related to secure boot, but important in our use case, uh, every boot is a KZAC in open, open power. So if you want to verify the contents of the PCR <clears throat> registers in the TPM. You need the history of measurements that were made uh, because when you KSEC and you kernel, the TPM is not reset, so the, the PCR contents are not reset either. You need the history of the measurements in the new kernel to know whether the PCR values are the ones you expect or not. Um, also, you need um, to know uh, uh, at which uh, boot, which kernel, each measurement corresponds. So you have a measurement, you want to know if it was uh, before a given KSEC or after a given KSEC, so you need a marker uh, for, for the KSEC event. And IMA has the boot aggregate that serves that function. Uh, you have one boot aggregate per KSEC that you perform. Uh, and lastly, you also need the measurement list <clears throat> passed to the new kernel because the act of um, performing a KSEC file load itself generates new measurements and you want them passed on so that you can verify the, the TPM PCR values. So we have a feature already upstream since a kernel 4.10 on, on PowerPC uh, where when you perform a KSEC file load, uh, the kernel will serialize the IMA measurement list into, a, into an IMA KZAC buffer and pass it on to the next kernel. Then the new kernel will detect that this buffer is there and will load the, the measurements into its own uh, oh, measurement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. No problem. I, sorry, I think I'm talking too much. 
<laughs> but I'm at the end. Um, so <laughs> this uh, summarizes uh, how we solved the first issue that I mentioned before in the uh, earlier slide. Uh, it solves our problem with extended attribute signatures uh, by using the, the module signatures. So now Nina will talk about the other points. Yes. So if you remember from the Mimi's slides, there are three things required for the IMF result. First is signature, then the keys and the policies. Now we have the kernel with the, sign, with the signature, but we need the keys to verify those signatures. And as I mentioned that one of the requirement is that we, it is possible that you get the firmware keys to be loaded. The, the kernel images might be signed with the firmware keys, and we need to load these firmware keys in the kernel for verifying. So, so what's the problem? There exists key rings. Uh, yeah, from David Hall's presentation, people might have an idea about key ring. So there exist key rings, and uh, dot IMA and underscore IMA, like it is used by the IMA for appraisal. So store these keys into the I store the firmware keys into these key rings. So, but what is the problem? Let's see. Uh, dot IMA actually accepts only the signed keys, and these signed keys are watched by the keys which are present in the dot secondary and the dot built-in trusted keys. The, and the point is that uh, we, we want to emphasize is that the dot built-in and dot secondary should have only are actually accepting only signed keys. That is because. Since they are watching the keys, if they are um, unsigned, and if somebody puts an unsigned malicious key, they might end up watching most of the other malicious keys, which are there in which may be loaded into the dot timer and can be used for the IMA present. So this is the like uh, dot second and dot built in that's why I expect only the signed keys. And the same that the dot IMA then needs the keys which are signed and watched by these two. Underscore IMA is the one which is the user's defined key ring, and it can accept the keys which are unsigned and generally loaded, typically loaded in, in its MFS before the system pivots through. The second key property is the modifiability. The built-in trusted keys are actually compiled in time, you, define, you add the certificate, but the other keys are, key, can be modified via the user space. And the scope, the limited and broad. So the, as I said, the built-in and secondary key rings are used for verifying other keys or for the module signatures. That's the only purpose for them. So that's why we say its scope is limited. But for the dot IMA and underscore IMA, keys are used for multiple purposes. So now if we see, and if we need a firmware keys to be loaded, what is the requirement? These come from the firmware. The first question is, does the kernel trust the keys which are coming from the firmware? So you can also see in another way pre-boot keys or the post-boot keys. Uh, that is one thing. Second thing, since the uh, keys are provided by the firmware, we, want the, we, we would not want any user to be able to modify them. And if we try to match, none of these actually are satisfying this. So I need a compiling key loaded from firmware, but the, they should, uh, but the kernel may not trust them. And also, the firmware keys may not always be signed. So I may not be able to verify their signature chain of trust. Secondly, these are used for, the scope is only to use them for the kernel image verification, and they should not be user modifiable. Now, if we, yes, yeah, so, so that's where to satisfy these three requirements, we propose a new key ring, which is called the platform keys, and the purpose of this is that you load the firmware keys. Basically, you need to provide an isolation. The kernel has to isolate the keys provided by firmware, which may be unsigned, and the keys which its own provides by the, from the kernel itself, and which it trusts. So this platform key ring, the purpose of this is to provide that isolation between the untrusted firmware keys and the trusted keys. Uh, it can be loaded either the compiled in time as a single certificate, or loaded from the boot time, uh, these accepts unsigned keys, so they need not be uh, satisfy any chain of trust. And then the node modifiable, they should not be overridden by user space. So basically, these keys, once loaded at the boot time, uh, nobody can change them. Uh, you can, uh, we can enable this by a config option, config platform key ring, and config platform trusted keys. So here is how it looks like, dot platform keys. It has the same permission as the dot built-in because it doesn't, it need not be modifiable by user. And yes, that, that, that's what the thing is. So this actually provides, a, it allows us to use the firmware keys, which comes from the pre-boot time, may or may not be signed, to be used by the bootloader for the kernel image verification, and only for the limited purpose of the kernel image, and are not modifiable by user. 
And that's how we solve this problem. The second thing, so again, uh, the third thing which is required for the appraisal is the policy. IMA will do the appraisal only if there is a policy defined for it. And we need KXA kernel check is the existing policy uh, rule which can be used for the kernel image verification. But what's the problem? Let's discuss that. Uh, these are the default policies. Uh, these are the existing policies available now. The upper two are more of default policies for different purposes. Our focus is more on the secure boot and the secure boot specific policies, which can which has a k-exec kernel check. So the last two does that. Uh, the secure boot policy is defined as the boot parameter, and it can be overwritten by the user space by writing it to the uh, sys kernel security IMA policy file. This is not preserved across k-exec because I might have loaded my host OS with the boot parameter secure boot, but I can do another k-exec without this parameter, and there are no secure boot policies anymore. The second option to fix this, the next option that comes is the build time policy, so that it cannot be modified by the user. And so here, these are defined at the compile time. These, uh, yeah, this has come recently. So these are defined at the compile time. You, you choose them, we have to choose them as a config option. And they are same policies defined with the KXA kernel check as the secure boot. The, the, and they are not custom modifiable. And, but the problem is these are hard coded. Once it's built, it's written, it's, uh, it's built into the kernel, it's built. Those won't handle the secure boot state of the system. Because that is what we need. We need something which is runtime, which at the boot time understands the state, secure boot state of the system, whether it is an audit mode or a user mode or a setup mode. Because the setup mode may not need any verification, but the user mode needs verification. So it can define the policy, it can check the policy accordingly. It should not be custom modifiable. Nobody should be able to write to override it, and it should be preserved across KXA. Since every KXA will actually should be checking the secure boot state and accordingly defining the policy, and the state of the system will not be changing. So that way it can be preserved. Uh, so to handle this, we propose another policy called architecture specific policies, which can be defined specific to each architecture based on their requirements. And these are loaded at the boot time. Uh, these are, yeah, based on the secure boot state, they are of the highest priority. If these are defined, no other policy will be uh, overtaking them. Uh, these are the ones which are given the priority. They cannot be overridden by boot parameter because these are specified at the runtime. No boot parameter is required to use, uh, to define them. The, uh, one more thing is, there's an IMA press type flag. You can make it, the IMA press type can be used as a log, enforce, or fix. So I might have defined the policies, but if I make the IMI press equals to fix or lock, I can still boot an unsigned kernel. So this flag has to be very, uh, very carefully used uh, along with the policies. So we, when the architecture policies are enabled, the IMI press type option, boot parameter option is disabled so that it can be configured again at the runtime. This option can be enabled by IMI arc policy. Here I'm showing an example of the policies as we are considering for the open power solution. For the setup mode, we do want to do measurement, but we don't want to do the appraisal. And this is where is the uh, don't appraise. But for the audit and user mode, we want to do both measure and appraisal. So based on the secure boot state, the runtime, the code will actually load one of this. So we started saying that IMA can be used for this in a generic way, but we found some problems. We just talked about the solutions for those problems, and if we combine them all of together, here is how you see the solution of it as a complete work. The boot kernel is loaded. Uh, it checks the secure boot mode of the system. If it is in the setup mode, you don't, we don't need any kernel verification. Uh, so no keys are loaded onto the platform keying. No policies are set. But if we get into the audit or user mode, we need the keys, so we load them. We need the keys from the, form, uh, from the platform, so we load them to the platform keying. And now these keys are locked. Nobody can modify them later. And these are isolated from other keys of which the kernel uses. These are specifically available only in dot .platform keys. Uh, audit, if it is in the audit mode, the policies for audit and the user mode are same. The only difference is the IMI press flag is log for the audit mode. But in case of the user mode, IMI press flag is enforced. Because here we want to make sure that 
uh, if, it, if it fails to verify the kernel, it just doesn't boot. And then we have the keys, we, we have the certificates, we have the policy, and the petit boot fetches the <laughs> kernel image, uh, it verifies the appended signature. We have the appended signature on it. So it verifies the appended signature, and if it is verified, then host OS is loaded. So this is how the all three problems, solutions for those three problems combined together gives us a complete solution. Uh, here is the patch set status. So we talked about three features, appended signatures, platform keying, and architecture-specific IMA policies. Uh, the two patch sets, IMA support for appended signatures and the platform keying are awaiting the acceptance. Uh, they are Post, they were posted and are available on these reference links. Uh, for the IMA support for architecture-specific policies, we are soliciting acts and reviews for the x86-specific pages, which we have in that. Uh, then the carry IMA measurements file across KXEC is already upstream, as Tiago mentioned. Then the loading keys into the platform keying. Uh, these are based on David Howell's patches. His patch set uh, keys, blacklisting, and UEFI database load. We have used two patches in that, uh, like EFI, add EFI signature data types and add an EFI signature blob parser because OpenPower also uses the ESL format for the keys, uh, sign for the keys. So this is a work in progress, and the power specific arc policies is the work in progress. In summary, uh, IMA provides the kernel based solution for the verifying the host OS to give us a secure boot solution, I mean, as part of our end-to-end -end solution. Uh, we had three problems out of it for the keying, for the signature, and uh, for the policy. We fixed them by introducing platform keying, IP-specific policies, and appended signatures. We have the patch sets either in the state of upstreaming, uh, awaiting acceptance, or awaiting reviews, or are work in progress. We welcome the community to test them, give their reviews back, give, their in, give your inputs and feedbacks, whatever you think about those. And this is where I have the demo for the, uh, these patches. If anybody is interested, we can, I can show that later, afterwards. Uh, these are the references. And this is the acknowledgments for our team who had worked, uh, the IBM LTC security team who is working, and we work in collaboration with the security research group and uh, 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 IBM Power Security and the Power from the team. Yes. Questions? Anyone? Could you give us m some more details about key executing crash kernel and signing the its user space? Uh, so what details do you need? I mean, Actually, KXEC is uh, very often used to um, launch a crash kernel, which uh, is able to export your, uh, me uh, the memory of your crashed kernel and use, uh, use um, uh, PROG VM core to dump its memory. Is it somehow affected? And there are two um, in this. Um, so basically, the KEXEC file load um, is doing the signature verification. And then, in order to, and there are two patches in this patch set which um, disable KEXEC load as well. If you have the IMA policy, then, um, and you're using the, um, and you're using the IMA signature verification, then it will prevent the k-exec load. Um, but if you're using the regular um, signature verification, um, kernel sig the architecture specific one, then um, if you're not in secure boot mode, it won't um, disable k um, the k-exec load. So it depends if you're in secure boot mode or you're not in secure boot mode. Right, that was the compromise. More questions? If not, let's thank the speakers. <laughs> <laughs>